In the previous video, we saw that when we apply central difference finite difference approximations to a differential equation, we end up with a tridiagonal system of equations to solve. So in this video, we want to look at some of the properties of those tridiagonal systems. In particular, take a look at the condition number, diagonal dominance, and see how that affects the outcome when we perform operations on tridiagonal systems of equations. So let's consider a simplification of the general tridiagonal system that we had last time. So let's say it's n by n, and it's a toplets matrix. A toplets matrix is such that the diagonal elements are all the same. So in other words, in this case, the a's are all the same, the b's are all the same, and the c's are all the same. In that particular case, you can show that the eigenvalues are of this form. b plus 2 times the square root of a times c times the cosine of little n pi over big N plus 1. Little n is the index going from 1 to capital N, which again is the size of the matrix, the number of unknowns in our system of equations. The smallest and the largest of the eigenvalues are given when little n is either 1 or capital N. So 1 or capital N. Now which one of these two is the smallest or largest depends on the A's and the B's and the C's, but those will give us the smallest and the largest. So what I'd like to do is get to the condition number for such tridiagonal matrix. But before we do, let's show how we can get a large N approximation of the condition number. So we're going to take a look at this cosine term here and here. We're going to expand those using Taylor series, and as N becomes large, then we can get an approximation for these cosine terms. So let's take a look at that. The details here aren't terribly important. So for the first one, the pi over capital N plus 1, we're going to expand the Taylor series around 0. And for the other one, the N pi to over N plus 1 is going to be expanded around pi. So here is that first one. Here's the Taylor series. Here's the second one. Here's the Taylor series. And if you square this, you'll get this as the first term. And of course, there's many more terms, but let's just keep the first couple. Again, the details aren't terribly important. Let's just focus on how we can use these Taylor series approximations, which will truncate in order to get an approximation for the condition number when n becomes large. So let's say first that a is 1, b is minus 2, and c is 1. So you'll notice here that this is only weakly diagonally dominant. The a plus the c is 2 and the magnitude of b is also 2, so it's weakly diagonally dominant. So we cannot prove that it's well conditioned, but we hope and expect that it's not going to be too bad. And we'll see how that works out. I'll show an example in a moment. So for these values of a, b, and c then, lambda 1, substitute them in, and simplify to get the first term, we get the square of pi over n plus 1. And then for the other one, lambda sub n by magnitude, Again, put in the values of a, b, and c. The first term is going to be 4. You can see that here. 2 times the square root of 1 times 1. That's just 2. 2 times minus 1 is minus 2. Minus 2 minus 2 is minus 4. Take the absolute value, and that's 4. So that's the first term. And again, you can, you can trace those details through. So then the condition number is the ratio of the largest to the smallest of the eigenvalues. Now that's only true for a symmetric matrix, but in this case it is symmetric because the C and the A are the same. So then the largest is 4, so it's 4 over the smallest, which is the square of pi over n plus 1. So we can express that in this form. 4 over pi squared times the square of capital N plus 1. Now this is a large n approximation. So this is showing how the condition number changes as we increase n. And you'll notice it goes like n squared. So that's a very rapid increase. As n increases, the condition number is increasing like the square of capital N. Now let's take a look at a case where a is 1, c is 1 again, but now the b is minus 4. So in this case now, it is strictly or strongly diagonally dominant because 1 plus 1 is less than 4. We would expect this to be well conditioned. We would not expect to have any large errors when we invert this or do any operations with this tridiagonal matrix. If we go through the same process with those cosines, we can get an, a large n estimate for the condition number. And in this case, it would be 6 divided by 2, which is simply 3. So you'd notice it doesn't involve n. So what that means is as n increases, it's going to asymptote to 3. So the condition number will never be any larger than 3. And remember, 1 is a perfect condition number. 
infinity would correspond to a non-invertible matrix, and the larger the condition number, the more ill-conditioned it is. So three is an excellent condition number. We don't expect to have any issues with numerical operations on this matrix. And again, that's consistent with the fact that this is strictly diagonally dominant. Now you may remember the Hilbert matrix that we used in an earlier example to illustrate the effect of ill-conditioned matrices, very large condition numbers on inversion and other matrix operations. Here we're going to do the same thing, same process. We'll take our matrix, which in this case is now a tridiagonal matrix. We'll invert it. We'll multiply the matrix times its inverse and we should get back the identity matrix if we're to do that exactly. We won't do it exactly, we'll do it numerically, given double precision arithmetic, as we've discussed in previous videos, when we'll see what effect round off error has on such operations. So let's begin by looking at the case where we have minus fours on the main diagonal. So this is the strictly diagonally dominant case, which is well conditioned. First, we'll look at a 10 by 10 tridiagonal matrix, so a small version. The Condition number is 2.84. That's obtained using, for example, Mathematica or MATLAB or Python. And you can see that that's a rather low value. It's close to one. And in fact, it's very close to three, even though the size is only 10. So our large N estimate works actually quite well, even in the 10 by 10 case. Now remember that if we take the log base 10 of our condition number, we get the number of digits that we would expect to lose in doing matrix operations, such as the inverse on our matrix. So that's only about 0.5, so we don't expect to lose any more than one of our 16 digits of accuracy when doing operations. So this is an example of a well-conditioned matrix. And indeed that's the case. So again, if we take the original matrix times its inverse, we should get the identity matrix, and we do within one digit of accuracy. Now to see the scaling of this, let's increase capital N to 1,000. So now we have it 1,000 by 1,000 matrix with minus fours down the main diagonal, ones and ones on the lower and upper diagonals. In that case, get the actual condition number, and it's 2.99998, which as you'd expect, and as you would hope, is very close to the three estimate that we have for the large N case. So once again, no matter how big N is, no matter how big our matrix is, we will never get a condition number that's larger than three for this strongly diagonally dominant case. And if you put 2.99998 in here, you're still not going to get anything bigger than one. So we're still only going to lose no more than one digit of accuracy when doing the inverse. And again, that is the case. I would strongly encourage you to play with these. Program this into MATLAB. Program this into Python. And play with different sizes. Check the condition number. Do the inverse. Multiply by the original matrix and see how it compares with the identity matrix. It's good practice and you'll get a better feel for what's going on with these matrices. Now let's look at the case where we have minus twos down the main diagonal. So now it's a weakly diagonally dominant case. Once again, the 10 by 10 tridiagonal matrix. Now the condition number is 48.4, which is larger. It's not huge, but of course it's larger than three. The large N approximation would be 49.04. So again, it's actually not that bad an approximation, even for only a 10 by 10 matrix. Now when you take the log base 10 of the condition number, you get 1.7. So we expect to lose no more than two digits of accuracy when doing operations with this matrix. Still not bad, clearly not as good as the strongly diagonally dominant case, but not too bad, given that we have 16 digits of accuracy to work with. Once again, if you do the operations I've suggested, you'll see that you do indeed get 14 digits of accuracy in the resulting matrix. Now for 1,000, so much larger n, because the condition number is going up like n squared, we do expect a much larger condition number. So it's going up to 406,000, which again is very, very close to the large n estimate. So now log base 10 of 406,000, well that's between five and six. So we now expect to lose between five and six digits of accuracy. That is more significant, that's more concerning. So I have 16 to start with. If I lose five or six, I have roughly 10 left. If that's the final answer that I'm looking for, that's probably okay. If I'm gonna do something more with these numbers, do some more calculations with additional round off errors, then maybe that's not. But, in, but you can see the effect of increasing N on this weekly diagonally dominant case. It gets quite ill-conditioned rather quickly.